I had the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. And he really needs no introduction because I think we've seen him multiple times. And he is our esteemed Science Advisory Board Chair. I am going to please invite up Rich Alexander. And he is going to talk about translating the science seminar from yesterday. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think for these next couple of sessions, this should be hopefully a um, uh, uh, exciting uh, message that we're going to be uh, conveying about all of the kinds of activities that are going on. Uh, frankly, these are um, research <coughs> initiatives that I think hold great promise. And uh, as I go over some of that, I think you'll understand why I have such enthusiasm for it. If I could have my <coughs> first slide, I wanted to start this morning by just taking a step back <coughs> and going over some information to help put what we're doing here in uh, some context. And to also uh, go over with you some of the activities that the Scientific Advisory Board has been involved with, uh, what our role is, and then discuss, uh, discuss some of the um, awards that uh, uh, we reviewed this last uh, year and the process that we go through to uh, vet these uh, very, very competitive research uh, proposals. Now, I was struck by the fact that as I was walking down a main street in a major metropolitan city um, two weeks ago, uh, I was um, walking down and I was encounter I countered this, uh, this storefront which says asbestos, asbestos, dangerous asbestos. And it wasn't just this one storefront, it was the entire city block that was wrapped with this asbestos tape with a tall building that was uh, scheduled for demolition. And I bring that up only because it reminded me that the specter of asbestos exposure continues to be a significant uh, risk uh, to people in the U.S. that this asbestos material uh, is um, in a lot of buildings that have stood uh, for many years and as renovations and demolitions occur that the continued risk of asbestos even though the production has stopped uh, will continue uh, to be there. Now mesothelioma you have to appreciate is a disease that has almost a, um, almost a unique standing in the spectrum of, of the field of oncology in the US. And I want to go over with you what that means and what the challenges are, but where the unique opportunities are as well. If you look at the, the spectrum of cancer in the US, you have to appreciate that this is, uh, by many credible definitions, our number one health problem. It is the number one cause of death in all Americans under the age of 85. It has overtaken heart disease probably about six, 10 years ago. And so it is a major public health problem. The major cancer killers are those that you see here, uh, lung cancer, excluding mesothelioma, uh, prostate cancer, colon, and pancreas. And the top three in and of themselves account for over half of all the cancer deaths in the United States. And so you can understand that when research dollars are apportioned, uh, that there would be a natural tendency to focus on the top cancer killers. And I think, in fact, um, if you look at the distribution of research dollars, that you would see that there is a huge focus on, uh, on pancreas cancer, liver and bile duct cancer, as well as the other common cancers that we've uh, been afflicted with. About 1.7 million people in the U.S. are afflicted with cancer every year. Um, about 45% um, about of those individuals uh, will eventually succumb to cancer. And the risk, the lifetime risk of developing cancer uh, is extraordinarily high in the United States. It's almost one in two for men and one in three for women, any type of cancer. And so, Clearly, the public recognizes that cancer is a major public health problem, and in very credible polls that have been performed, most Americans feel that we are not doing enough, that it is not a high enough priority uh, in terms of uh, research 
uh, and um, efforts to make advances in cancer treatment. Now, the one message that I want to convey to all of you, and I think this slide bears it out, is that research cures cancer. There's no question about it. There is no question about it. And you can see that over the last several decades, the mortality from some of the common cancers that have been heavily researched and for, for which new therapies have been developed, the mortality is declining. That's particularly true in lung, prostate, colon. Uh, this is uh, for males and in females. You can see that breast cancer is also declining. I'm not certain that we can say the same about mesothelioma. And I don't know if we have those statistics available to us over the course of decades, but my guess is that we're not seeing these types of declines in mortality as we are in those cancers that have enjoyed funding uh, for research to develop new methods of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. So to put it into context then, we have, meso oops, we have mesothelioma, which is a rare cancer, only about 3,500 to maybe 4,000 cases in the U.S. every year. As everyone knows, it arises from the soft tissues that surround the major body cavities, the chest or the abdomen. There are no screening tests for it. So unfortunately, unless you're in a family for which mesothelioma is known to be prevalent, um, this condition is usually diagnosed at a more advanced as opposed to an early, more treatable stage. These are the types of x-rays that clinicians will encounter when seeing somebody with mesothelioma, either of the peritoneum or of the chest. And in this uh, scan right here, this is an individual lying on their back with their head up behind the screen and their feet out towards us. And you can see that this is the normal liver here, the normal spleen and stomach, but all of this grayish matter that is surrounding the normal intestinal structures is fluid as a consequence of having peritoneal mesothelioma. In the chest, you can see that in this individual here, it's heavily afflicting their left side. These are the kidneys and the bladder here, so those are normal structures, but this is what it looks like on a PET scan uh, in somebody with a thoracic mesothelioma. And this is just a picture to show you what it looks like under the microscope, but the message here is very simple. This is chaotic, uncontrolled growth of these cells. They know no regulation and will continue to grow and divide and spread uh, and even metastasize if left unchecked. Now, mesothelioma has essentially two drugs that have been uh, acknowledged and utilized in the treatment. Pemetrexid and cisplatinum are the main ones. There are other derivatives um, uh, that can be applied, but there are really very limited treatment options. Uh, we know that in some individuals <coughs> these can be very effective, but in general, uh, when compared to other chemotherapeutics for the more common cancers, uh, these would be considered to be less as opposed to more effective. As an example, in colon cancer, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've probably seen the approval of no fewer than 10 new biologic and chemotherapeutic agents that have really changed the landscape in the treatment of patients with colon cancer. Uh, but we have not enjoyed that same kind of period of discovery and development in mesothelioma. For most patients, as everyone knows here, the, uh, uh, the hope is that the disease is contained such that an operative procedure can be done to remove the tumor. And I just, I, tr I show these pictures decidedly. I know this is a group that uh, is very vested in understanding this disease, and, and, and I would not normally show these to a, a, a general audience. But this is an individual who is about to undergo a major thoracic procedure with a large incision through the rib cage, obviously with a very significant pain and, uh, and uh, risk of uh, potential complications. This is the uh, look of somebody with peritoneal mesothelioma. This is the abdomen that's obviously very distended with ascites, uh, for which that individual will undergo a laparotomy, an incision through the abdomen uh, to try and remove their disease. Now, We've brought this up before. I think Mary mentioned it last night, but um, mesothelioma is one of those few diseases that has these features to it. The mortality remains high. 
there are limited approved treatments that are not considered to be curative in, in, uh, in their um, uh, curative as, as part of treatment. And so I believe that they really qualify for this designation of a recalcitrant cancer. And if we can get mesothelioma to have that designation, it would, I think, elevate its profile in the oncologic community within the government, and I think it would help facilitate additional research funding uh, for an area where we badly need to make some significant advances. And I went on to the NIH, I'm sorry, the NCI website. Uh, I would tell you, uh, if any of you had some uh, time, this is a very interactive website. If you just go to nci.gov, you can look up all kinds of information about cancer, clinical trials, cancer statistics. And why I show this, I'm not certain if that's readable, but it's really not so important. But if you look at research funding by cancer type, you see a drop-down menu. And that drop-down menu contains at least three or four dozens of cancers. I'm not sure I've got every one of them included here, but on that list, mesothelioma does not exist. It's invisible. It's invisible. And some of these tumors are probably no more prevalent than mesothelioma, and so why that diagnosis would not be part of a drop-down menu that you can look to see specific funding by disease site is kind of a surprise to me, but it tells me that we have work to do. We have work to do in terms of elevating the profile of this disease in the eyes of the government and in the eyes of the public. Now, the scientific advisory board that works uh, within the MARF organization is a group of scientists that represent various disciplines in the field, clinical, basic science, um, surgical, medical oncology, radiation, pathology, um, we're all there. And it's been a privilege for me to be uh, the chair of that board uh, starting this last year. I think it serves an incredibly important role in supporting the mission of MARF. Uh, as scientists, our role is to try to help MARF with its advocacy and educational activities, as well as review the uh, very large number of proposals that are submitted to the foundation uh, for research funding. We just had a scientific advisory board uh, meeting at the beginning of this uh, uh, meeting two days ago, and we've talked about some uh, very exciting initiatives uh, that we hope to be considering in the future uh, that will help MARF with its, uh, with its overall mission. I will also tell you that the members of this board really, really constitute some of the brightest minds in the entire field of oncology. There's just no question about it that you couldn't ask for a, a more qualified group of individuals who are dedicated to a disease than the ones that sit on the scientific advisory board. So all of you should rest assured that if there are opportunities that we can identify that this is the group that is capable of doing that. Now, one of the things that I did as the chair of the scientific advisory board um, several months ago, and I was invited by Melinda Katzian to uh, participate in this, and I was very grateful for that opportunity, was to be a part of a congressional briefing on Capitol Hill uh, to educate congressmen and staffers about mesothelioma, uh, elevate, its, uh, elevate the awareness of this disease, and try to promote uh, um, um, initiatives to uh, increase funding for this disease. Um, I was faced with, I thought, a pretty difficult task because in the current com uh, climate of, um, of research, uh, clearly, we have limited research dollars, uh, and we have a lot of competing more common cancers that also have advocates uh, working for them. And I, I wanted to make a point, though, that I wanted to share with you that I think mesothelioma uh, should be looked at very critically because there are opportunities that would be potentially relevant to the broad field of oncology uh, by studying mesothelioma more carefully. It turns out and I'm going to give you some examples that historically, when you look at the major seminal breakthroughs that have occurred in cancer over the last 20 to 30 years, a disproportionate number of those have been made in rare cancers. Under fundamental discoveries that have applied to the entire field, and there are reasons for that, one of them is the fact that rare cancers seem to have a molecular homogeneity, a personality 
that is a little bit more uniform than common cancers like lung cancer or colon cancer, which really, when you dissect them down, are diseases that we treat like 10 different diseases. There are treatments for, for patients with breast cancer that are highly individualized based upon the, the uh, unique features of their tumor. So it's not just one disease. Rare diseases tend to behave a little bit differently. They tend to be a little bit more uniform in their molecular profile. And research here has been underfunded because asbestos is everywhere and we just, I think, underestimate the risk of this as a public health uh, risk. And I've always almost, and I also made the point that in patients with mesothelioma, there is, I think, a disproportionate amount of suffering that occurs uh, once the diagnosis is made. Now, when you look at the very fundamental um, processes that occur in the development of cancer, one of them is a mutation in a gene uh, called a tumor suppressor gene. This is a gene that sits in every cell in the body that really acts as a break. This gene produces a protein that is a very important regulatory protein in the cell that makes it work normally, that keeps it from dividing uncontrollably and doing things that it was not designed to do genetically. When those break genes do not work, cells begin to grow in an uncontrolled fashion. We understand this to be one of the fundamental mechanisms of neoplasia in general. And the discovery of that was, was made in a very rare childhood cancer, the retinoblastoma tumor. So one of the things you would argue is that there may be, there may be fundamental aspects of mesothelioma that would be important in other types of common cancers. Here's another example, oncogenes. Dr. Harold Varmus, who's now the director of the NCI, won the Nobel Prize for his seminal role in the identification of this phenomenon of cancer genes, which is the opposite type of a gene. This is a gene that, when, when it becomes altered, uh, conveys a new function in the cell that allows it to do things that it was not programmed to do in nature and work more rapidly. It would be kind of like somebody putting the accelerator on the car and uh, not taking and, and, and disengaging the brakes. And it turns out that oncogenes are appreciated to be the common mechanism by which many common cancers occur, and yet it was discovered in really very rare cancers. Research in sarcoma, medullary thyroid cancer, and CML were the diseases in which this type of oncogene phenomenon was identified, all of them rare cancers. Angiogenesis. Everyone understands that angiogenesis is a fundamental process for cancer progression, that cancers have to develop this ability to commandeer new blood vessels into their tumors uh, in order for them to develop oxygen and nutrient supply. And this is something that's been a field of research that has been very fruitful. And now we use anti-angiogenesis compounds in a large number of very common cancers, but the phenomenon of angiogenesis was actually described in a rare form of familial kidney cancer. So if we had just had a policy 25 years ago that we weren't going to study any rare cancers, I don't think the landscape of cancer care and understanding cancer would be where it is today. And I would submit to you that I don't think any of us are smart enough to understand whether or not mesothelioma holds the next major advance in the field of oncology. There may be something there that would be applicable to, to cancer in general. I had the honor of treating an individual with mesothelioma some years ago, and I show this picture because he was very, very public about his condition. Uh, this is Hamilton Jordan. Many of you may recognize that name. He was the chief of staff uh, for President Jimmy Carter. Uh, he was credited with developing the uh, campaign strategy that allowed a one-term governor from a southern state uh, to ascend to the presidency of the United States, and it was a model that was used by other candidates uh, in subsequent campaigns, and, and, and he was thought to be a very, very uh, innovative strategist with respect to uh, politics in America. And he was an individual who developed multiple cancers in his lifetime. The last one, and unfortunately the one that took his life, was mesothelioma. This is his family, this is Dorothy and their three children. Um, when he came to visit me, uh, at the University of Maryland. Um, he went through treatment, and as he recovered from treatment, he began to engage me in terms of helping me understand how to uh, raise awareness and solicit support 
for mesothelioma research and treatment. And I will say that he, uh, as many of you, uh, really probably did uh, more for me than I could ever have done for him. He was just a remarkable guy and unfortunately succumbed to his cancer about a year and a half after treatment. But he left me with a, a um, understanding that I did not have before about how important um, and how effective organization and advocacy can be to raise awareness and make advances in cancer. His message, which he gave uh, uh, around the country, uh, was very clear and I think is still relevant today. He made the point that 50% of all Americans are at risk of developing cancer in their lifetime, that cancer research must become a higher national priority. At the time that he was actually advocating for it was during the initial Gulf War back in the early 1990s, and he had a statistic which I have actually found astonishing, that during the height of the first Gulf War, every month that we were at war, we spent more money in Iraq than we had spent in 25 years in cancer research since the signing of the National Cancer Act in the United States. I was just astounded at that. And I went back and checked his numbers, and he was absolutely right. So just to repeat what I had started to say before, the MARF uh, has the Scientific Advisory Board. These are scientific experts from around the globe. We support the mission of MARF. We annually review the grant process, which I'm going to go through in just a minute. Uh, but this is a very, very rigorous uh, and unbiased uh, review process. You have to understand that in the landscape of, um, of grants in the United States um, this day and age, that if you apply for an investigator-initiated uh, grant through the NIH, the likelihood of getting funded is less than 10%. Now, I thought about that because this last summer I was at an agricultural fair with my then 17-year-old daughter, and we were walking through the carnival, and there was this little game that you play where you take the water gun, you shoot it into the clown's mouth, and the balloon blows up on his head. And if you pop the balloon, you win a doll. So we're sitting there and we're looking at all of those people. I said, let's play that game. And she said, Dad, there are already too many people there. My chances aren't very good. I said, there's nine people. She said, one in 10. That's not enough for me to worry about shooting water into the clown's mouth. Now, if you're an investigator and you've got to write a grant that's going to take you six weeks of significant effort, collaboration, getting it through the budget process, getting it through the approval process, getting it submitted, having it reviewed, revising it, resubmitting it, and it's all going to be a 10% chance, there's a lot of people that would be discouraged by those statistics and might not even submit their grant. Reminds me of another little story, if I can tell you. This is a very important one, but um, about 25 years ago, you know, ulcer disease in this country was a very, very common problem. And the dogma, the medical dogma in those days was that ulcer disease was simply caused by acid overproduction. And that the way you treat ulcers is by blocking acid production. And there were medications that were developed to block acids. There were operations that were done to cut the nerves that produce acid in the stomach. There were anti-ulcer diets that people were on, sometimes for years at a time. There were two researchers uh, at that time at the University of Virginia, a gastroenterologist and a, um, uh, a pathologist, who were treating a number of patients who had ulcer disease. And as they were looking at biopsies of patients with ulcers, they saw little inclusion bodies in the tissues, and they didn't understand what those were. But they had an idea. They said, wait a minute, those look like bacteria. And their hypothesis was that it wasn't acid that was causing ulcers, it was an infection that was causing damage to the tissues of the abdominal lining, to the gastric lining. Now, the experts in the field dismissed their work as marginal insignificance and probably inconsequential. They did have trouble getting grants, but they were dogmatic and persevered and discovered that in fact ulcer disease is an infectious problem caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, which is treated with antibiotics. And it changed the complexion, the face of how we understand and treat ulcer disease in this country. It eliminated the need for patients to undergo uh, lifelong therapy with antacids, to undergo operative procedures to block the uh, acid secretion in their stomachs. Um, and as it turns out, they won the Nobel Prize in 2005 for their discoveries. 
I think it was doctors Warren and Bishop. I may not have the names lead. You remember their names? It was, I think, Warren and Bishop. But my point is this. I don't think any of us are smart enough to know where the great discoveries in cancer advances are going to come from. And 10% of all proposals that are submitted are funded. What if the next great advance in cancer care was in that next 10%? We need to have a higher funding line if we're going to include all of those very high impact studies that may have significant promise. And that's where organizations like the MARF are going to have an increasingly important role because clearly we're going to have to turn to uh, support from sources outside the government. This process that we had in terms of a review um, was mirrored on the NIH grant review process. It was a two-tiered review in which um, two to three reviewers were assigned to uh, each of the 50 proposals that we received. And I tell you, I read almost every one of them completely. These were extraordinarily high caliber, innovative uh, reviews. And it was very, very hard for me at the outset to understand how we were going to be able to prioritize these uh, for, a, uh, for a funding grant. After the initial reviews uh, were done, we basically then decided on the top half and the bottom half. And then the top half of the grants were then redistributed uh, to multiple reviewers and were again re-reviewed. And then we used, um, as the NIH does, a, 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 an objective scoring system that has various parameters uh, that are graded in terms of innovation, significance, uh, the, um, the credentials of the institution and the investigator, and a number of these. And they're scored on a numeric level. And then the score is tabulated, and you get a grade. Uh, that basically then will allow you to kind of stratify the proposals. But all of the proposals were very, very close. But once we went through the, the two-tiered system, uh, we then came up with a list of 10 proposals that the board then, the scientific advisory board submitted to the, uh, to the board of directors of MARF uh, as a recommendation for grants that should be considered for funding. And I'm going to review the ones that were selected this year because it's a very interesting uh, it's a very interesting um, um, uh, set of, of proposals, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So as I said, the proposals were of exceptional quality. Uh, it's interesting to me because when you looked at the nature of the submissions, uh, we found a very interesting and encouraging phenomenon that we were not only seeing PIs that had established uh, interests in mesothelioma, but we were also attracting new investigators that had not been involved in mesothelioma research in the past who were submitting proposals. So we're increasing the, uh, the, um, the portfolio of research expertise uh, that is uh, now becoming interested in mesothelioma. It was also interesting to me that we were seeing uh, institutions that are well respected and recognized as leaders in cancer research from around the globe submitting grants. We also had many first-time submissions. This is very, very important. I think as investigators go through their career trajectory, uh, they would look initially to an organization like MARF uh, to provide them with some foundation funding that would allow them to get a grant uh, or proposal initiated to generate initial data that might then provide them with sufficient background information to to get a more major grant, uh, maybe through the uh, government uh, as a subsequent follow-on study. And so I was very encouraged by the fact that we did have many first-time uh, submissions. Most of these proposals are going to be scientific research proposals. And, and I bring up an important concept here that, you know, in the field of research, you basically have a um, two camps or two, two different types of research. One is going to be basic science research, which is generally done in a laboratory, or clinical research, which is going to be research done in the context of a hospital in which patients are going to be uh, given some type of a new type of intervention or um, uh, treatment uh, that is going to be subjected to a very critical review. Uh, because those types of studies uh, tend to be more expensive to run, uh, and because of the amount of money that MARF has to support research, most of the research proposals are going to be basic science proposals. And they came uh, with a diverse uh, range of areas in cancer research, including angiogenesis, molecularly targeted agents, novel imaging modalities, studies in epidemiology, which is the population science of mesothelioma, 
immunotherapy, and in looking at biomarkers, that is a uh, test that we can potentially do to, to determine the biological behavior of a tumor that would help us with respect to uh, most effective treatments. Um, I will also say, and this is very important, that the previous grants that have been supported by MARF have resulted in real and meaningful advances in the field. There's just no question about it. Um, I think that uh, if you look back and you see what has been done previously, uh, that those studies have translated into early phase clinical studies that are now ongoing at various places around the country. Uh, they are providing options and hope where there was none. And I think very importantly, they are heightening the awareness of the disease, not only in the, uh, um, in the um, general community, but in the scientific community. Um, what I would propose we do at this point, let me just see where we are with uh, time, is I'm going to um, stop here and uh, then we will have uh, Dr. Crew talk about the grant proposals that were funded last year, and then I will come back to the uh, proposals that we uh, just approved this last uh, cycle. Actually, we have a few questions, so if you want to answer those, we'll first. This was not part of the deal. I know. We're improvising. Okay. First question is. How long does it take you to actually tie a bow tie? No, that's not it. Uh, how do you distinguish between outside the box thinking and off the wall ideas since both go against conventional thinking? That's an excellent, excellent question. It's an excellent question. Um, this is a judgment. It's a judgment that has to be made and it has to be made very, very thoughtfully and deliberately. Um, generally, when you look at innovation, obviously there's a spectrum and we have to look at associated discoveries that support an unorthodox or an unproven idea. Um, if somebody were to say, I ex I'm going to take a brick and throw it out the window and I expect it to go up, we'd say, well, that's very innovative thinking. But it flies so forcefully in the face of everything we understand about how bricks generally behave when they're thrown out a window that we're going to have a hard time funding that. On the other hand, there could be ideas that are proposed that, um, uh, that make a leap of faith. That, you know, what we know to be true is this, what we expect might be true is this, and therefore, if we put those two together, this is what I propose. And so those kinds of extensions of, of scientific knowledge that take a step and a half uh, beyond where we are today are those types of innovations that I think are the ones that we were really looking for. Not just a, 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 an, an integral step forward saying, well, we know that we've done this and this and we're going to just do this and expect that we know the result, but that took that extra step where there was going to be some uncertainty, but there was a lot of intellectual reasoning that supported that, and that's how we try to make the difference. And it's a very fine line, and sometimes it's very hard to do. The uh, second question that I have here is, what should family members of a meso patient do? Any test to detect it early, uh, i.e. and family members, brothers, sisters, and children? And I'm going to also ask uh, Lee, uh, Dr. Krug when he comes up here to maybe address that. Um, the field of cancer screening is um, all over the map. Um, screening tests in and of themselves can be problematic. They can lead to people going through unnecessary testing because an, an inconsequential abnormality was found that needs to be um, diagnosed or, or um, um, followed a lot more carefully. Um, there are some situations in which screening tests clearly have shown to be beneficial. The example that I would give would be colonoscopy for colon cancer. You know, colon cancer, as you saw, number two cause of death in this country. And if people underwent colonoscopy the way that it has been recommended, the complexion of that disease would fundamentally change uh, the way that we understand it today. Um, so, it's, it's, so screening can have pros and cons. Now, with respect to mesothelioma, uh, the problem is that with respect to imaging, which is a common screening modality, that we do not have uh, discriminatory testing that will show us uh, disease reliably at an early stage. We're just at our limits, even with PET scan, MRI, CT scans, that we cannot see uh, tissue discrimination at a level that I think would give us uh, sufficient confidence that if we saw something, we were catching it early. The second thing is that many cancers 
as they develop in the body, they, grow, they go through a precursor stage, which means that uh, they develop into a abnormality that is considered precancerous, like a polyp in the colon. And so when you intervene at that stage, you basically have prevented the cancer from developing or identified it at a very early stage. And I'm not aware, I'm not aware that we have precancerous lesions in mesothelioma. Um, Lee, am I right on that? We just don't have that. So once we don't have an intermediate step that we could target to say this is a person who left untreated or without intervention would develop mesothelioma. And then the third area of screening would really be in kind of blood testing. And uh, that is a, that's an area that may have some promise, particularly if we could enrich the screening population so that it was only those people that had a higher than baseline risk. The problem with screening tests are that they can be very nonspecific. You can see abnormalities in blood tests uh, that, may not re that may not mean that you have a cancer. And again, it then precipitates a lot of additional diagnostic testing. So screening is clearly a, um, a complex topic. I think it, it is something that we would all like to see developed more effectively. Uh, and in meso, I think we have some exceptional challenges based upon the fact we have limitations in imaging, no precursor lesions, and, uh, and no indication of a, of a blood test as it stands right now. So there's work to be done there. Other questions? We're good. All right, I'm going to turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Krug, and then I will see you in a little bit. Thank you. was really a terrific overview and um, this morning I decided not to wear my name tag. I figured if you guys don't know who I am by now, I haven't been paying attention. So, um, so um, what I'm going to do uh, this morning is to go through some of the information about the grants that were funded in the 2012 year. Um, and the way the process is set up is that the grantees from that year, or in, in every case, two years after, the, grant, the grants that they are awarded are $50,000 a year for two years. And at the end of that two year time period, they are asked to come to the symposium and to present their findings from their research. Um, in, the, in several years past, this has taken place, but the, um, there have been really a limited number of other physicians or scientists there to listen to their presentations. And so this year, uh, Dr. Alexander and I uh, decided to really expand out the science session. And so we actually had a whole day on Wednesday. Uh, the grantees spoke first in the morning and went through their findings. But then the whole rest of the day was filled with talks, 10-minute talks. Um, and we had a nice quorum of physicians uh, from around the world who came. And it was a really nice opportunity for us to all get together and discuss collaborations and, and for people to, to see what was going on in the field. And I think that really boosted up the presence of the scientific community here at the meeting. And I think that was a big success. So I was really uh, pleased with that. Um, so there were one, two, three, five uh, grants that were uh, presented uh, from that year. And I didn't make any slides. I thought I'd just talk and, and kind of give you an overview of, of what was ex explained um, at a level that everyone can understand. And I, I think it's interesting because these Looking them over this morning, uh, you know, I could see how the uh, grants that were awarded really did cover a very broad spectrum of the most important areas of research in this disease. And it's kind of nice to see how that played out. So, for example, uh, Mitchell Chung, who is an investigator, works with Joe Testa at Fox Chase. He uh, is working in the area of BAP1. And We've heard many talks about this topic here at the meeting, you know, especially from Akeli Carbone. And uh, he and uh, Joe Testa were the ones really that reported on the two families with the, with the BAP1 gene that it carried through the, the two families, the L and the W family from Louisiana and Wisconsin. And 
so what Dr. Chung uh, uh, showed us from his work is that he actually took the exact gene mutation that was seen in those two different families. So there are different mutations that can occur. There's not just one kind of BAP1 mutation. There are multiple different kinds, and they can be what we call splice mutations or missense mutations, and those can really vary from one, and there, there are multiple others. But he took the two specific ones from the L and the W families and was able to grow mice that had those specific mutations, and that was really interesting. And then what he was able to do is to see uh, how that impacted the development of, of mesothelioma. He could inject asbestos fibers into the pleura and see if that increased the rate of development of mesothelioma. And he could also use that model to test different drugs. So for example, he tested one class of drugs called HDAC inhibitors, and he's planning to do another series of tests with uh, PARP inhibitors. And so it, it's exciting to see how you can use that model uh, to then spearhead drug development in that way. Um, we heard from Dario Barboni. He is at the UCSF. We actually had two UCSF um, presenters that day. Um, what they, they, their uh, project is interesting for two reasons. The first is that um, they have a pretty unique model for testing their uh, hypotheses as well. They use these uh, 3D spheroid models. So usually when you grow cancer cells in the uh, laboratory, most of the time uh, they'll just grow in a petri dish on a flat layer. And that doesn't necessarily model really what happens in, in humans or other animals, of course. Um, but in the, the way they grow them in, in their laboratory is in these spheroids. So the, um, they don't grow on the plate, but they kind of grow in suspension. And it, you would think they would kind of grow as little balls, but as it turns out, he showed that they grow more like disks. But the reason that's important is because that contact, the way the cells interact with each other is different in that setting. And it may give you a better sense of uh, biology of these things, and, and you can use that in a different way to test uh, that, the, the hypotheses that you want to look at. In particular, they, they're interested in chemotherapy resistance and what happens in those cells to, to create that resistance. And he identified three genes that were upregulated that impact that, something called ASS1, which is interesting because there's another uh, uh, series of studies that are going on targeting that pathway. It has to do with arginine metabolism, ANXA4, and MVP. And he showed that these genes were upregulated in patients as well and whether these uh, impact uh, the resistance of chemotherapy. And he's exploring various different drugs in, in that spheroid model to see if they can impact those genes and therefore uh, prevent or reverse chemotherapy resistance. Um, the next one to mention is uh, Juice Tegmans. Uh, he's from uh, Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands. And so here is what uh, Dr. Alexander was mentioning. You know, we have an international scope to our grant funding program. We received many applications from international investigators. And uh, so here's an example where we, we did fund one. The other significance of this particular grant is that it is exploring the importance of the immune system in this disease. And we've heard many talks over the course of this meeting about immunotherapy. And immu the concept of immunotherapy is really very broad, um, and there are different ways to approach it. But it's very interesting because uh, I I've worked in the area of immunotherapy, immun immunotherapy for many years. And for a long time, people really kind of dismissed it, said this is not going to work, that, you know, never had any positive data. But the tides have completely turned with regards to that now, and people, uh, and there are now drugs that are approved that use immunotherapy to uh, treat uh, various different malignancies. So this whole concept of immunotherapy can vary from one approach to another. So for example, I've as you know, I'm involved with the uh, vaccines, WT1 vaccine and so forth. And the way vaccines are supposed to work is that it's supposed to stimulate or 
boost your immune system to target a specific molecule in the cancer cell, be it a surface protein or something like that. So that could be considered immunotherapy. It's very specific. You're trying to boost the immune system against a specific thing that, that's present in a cancer but not present in other normal cells. Sometimes we use uh, antibody treatments, monoclonal antibodies. These are antibodies that are developed in the laboratory. And they are designed so you get a whole pool. Antibodies are uh, the part of the immune system that kind of float around and stick to something that's foreign. And it tags that foreign substance for your immune system to destroy it. So if you have, um, for example, in, in uh, mesothelioma, you have mesothelin. And it's expressed in the mesothelium, but not in the rest of your body. So you can create an antibody that'll go around and stick to that target, and then it'll tag it for the immune system to destroy it. And this kind of approach is kind of like what, uh, what we heard from uh, Rafit Hassan and from Ira Rapastin yesterday. Uh, in, in fact, their antibody uh, sticks to the, to the tumor cell, but it also has a molecule on there that's a toxin. And so the, that doesn't necessarily even need the immune system to help cause the cell death, because the uh, cell takes that up and it dies on its own. So that's another immune response, immune target therapy. Um, and now what's also become very much in vogue are these uh, antibodies that don't bind to the cancer, but they bind to the immune cells. And the way they work is that they, uh, usually your immune system has some checks in place so the immune system doesn't run rampant. Um, and so it has these, these molecules in place that stop the immune response once it starts to occur. This, these new antibodies are something called a CTLA-4 antibody and another one called PD-1 or PD-L1. And they basically take the brakes off the immune system. So you give patients these antibodies and their immune system really revs up. And interestingly, that can cause significant uh, responses in patients with cancer. There's already a drug approved like that for the treatment of skin cancer melanoma. It's called ipilimumab. And there are many others that are in development now also. Many of them have shown tremendous efficacy in other diseases such as lung cancer. And one of them actually is in a very large study right now in, in mesothelioma, a drug called tremolumumab, which is very similar to the one that's approved for skin cancer. And that's actually a large international randomized trial that's going on. So that area is obviously of strong interest in this disease as well. So coming back to Hegman's uh, presentation, his, his work involves trying to unravel a little bit better uh, the way the immune system works in mesothelioma. He was exploring pleural fluid samples to see if that corresponds to the immune system uh, response to the, the primary tumors and um, to look at the different types of immune cells that are in the fluid and in the tumor and see how the balance of those affects the immune reaction and the overall survival. And uh, understanding how the immune system works in this disease will help us better understand which drugs we need to use to target them and how to improve the efficacy of those drugs. Um, the next one I want to mention is a grant from Il Jun Kim, who's also at the UCSF, um, University of California, San Francisco. Um, I remember reviewing uh, this gentleman's grant because um, it was clear this investigator was a very seasoned investigator. It was an extremely well-written grant. And to the point where, uh, it, but he, he, he didn't have any, he didn't really have any experience in the field of mesothelioma. All of his work to, to that point had been mainly in lung cancer or some in breast cancer, I believe. Um, but his techniques seemed really interesting. And uh, <coughs> since he had done this uh, so well in other diseases, it was clearly feasible that if you wanted to do this investigation in mesothelioma, um, it would be highly feasible. So even though he didn't have any background in mesothelioma, we took a chance and thought this would be an interesting project, and so we, we funded his work. And what he's looking at, um, this 
this kind of goes to uh, somewhat what, uh, what Dr. Fennell was talking about at the reception the other night, trying to find genes that are abnormal in the cancer cells to target and to find uh, a treatment that would work against those. So uh, he's looking specifically at fusion genes. So, so normally, uh, like BAP1, for example, that gene is just mutated. But sometimes the mutation involves taking a piece of a gene from this part of the DNA and another piece from here and like putting them together and you get this fusion gene that can be abnormal and sometimes can cause cancer. And there's a terrific example of this in lung cancer where they identified this fusion gene called EML4-ALK. The EML4 part of the gene merged with ALK and this created a gene that, was, that causes cancer. And they found that this gene occurred in lung cancer and that there was a drug that was already being used for other, they were testing it for other purposes. They found this drug actually worked in lung cancer when you had that eml 4 alk mutation. And they tested it and it worked like gangbusters and that drug was, that drug chrysotinib was approved for lung cancer within four years of the scientific discovery that that fusion gene exists. So Dr. Kim took 40 uh, tumor samples of uh, mesothelioma and he did his assay and he actually identified potentially 15 uh, fusion genes out of his work. Um, they need to be validated and so forth, but that's the kind of project and, and then, you know, to match up to see if there are drugs that could target those particular fusion genes. So that's the kind of exciting work. And I, I realized what we had done by funding his grant because he came to the meeting and uh, we spoke at the reception that night after the science session and he was, I think, really impressed with the presentations that he heard at the meeting and with the level of science in this disease. Since he hadn't had any background in this area, he really didn't know, you know, the other investigators and he was able to meet a lot of them and form collaborations and I spoke to him about opportunities for other grants, such as through the DOD, and he was all excited about research in this disease. So bringing in people who ordinarily wouldn't have even thought about working in this field and bringing in these seasoned investigators into this realm is one important thing that these grants do. Um, the, the last one that I want to discuss is a grant from one of my colleagues, um, uh, Filippo Giancati, he works with me at Memorial. Um, and this is another area where we're looking at some of the altered pathways of signaling that occur in this disease. So um, we are, he and I are particularly interested in a pathway called PI3 kinase and mTOR. And basically that's just a signaling pathway. It's how the cell signals and when these cells, when these signals are increased, then it tells the cell to grow and divide and multiply and metastasize and so forth. And this pathway, PI3 kinase, is really important in a lot of different cancers. In fact, there's uh, drugs approved targeting this pathway in, in uh, this drug Everolimus is approved in, in kidney cancer and also in breast cancer. Um, and, this, and we know now that this pathway is also very important in, in mesothelioma as well. And so, um, ooh, and we've done studies actually with Everolimus in mesothelioma. We had a trial open at our center and also a large oncology group also studied it. But that, that drug only blocks mTOR, which is just one piece of this whole signaling pathway. And it, it, that didn't actually work. So uh, we think that there's probably other bypass pathways and so forth and that you might have to block more than one part of the pathway in order for for that to uh, halt the, the signaling in, in, that, in that model. Um, so now there are a multitude of these uh, inhibitors that are both, that inhibit both PI3 kinase and mTOR. These are uh, oral drugs. And um, in the laboratory, uh, we think that these work better in tumors that have a loss of a gene called NF2 and that's really common in mesothelioma. So that's why it seems really important for, for us to study these drugs. And as it turns out, um, there was a study that was done with one of these uh, oral drugs 
uh, from Genentech called GDC0980. And we saw actually several patients who had tumor shrinkage with that compound. It was, it was really exciting. Um, not sure what the future of that particular drug will be, um, but, the, um, but to be able to validate what we've seen in the laboratory in, in patients was really important. Um, but although that compound may not go forward, there are many companies that have very similar drugs that are targeting that same pathway. And in fact, we have one that we're testing now at our center. It just finished the phase one portion of the trial where we uh, decided on what the dose would be going forward and you know, what was the best uh, way to give it and, and the safety of it and what's the optimal dose to administer. And now there's going to be uh, another cohort of patients that will be enrolled, uh, probably be open in a couple months, where we'll treat a whole group of patients just with mesothelioma. And they'll, they're also looking at other diseases, breast cancer, for example, as another group. But uh, you know, the interest in this uh, area of signaling um, hopefully will allow other companies also to test their compounds in this disease. Because I really do think we saw some good activity in, in our model in, in, the, in that phase, in, the, in that uh, trial that we had done with the GTC 0980. Okay, um, and then the one last thing I want to mention is that also that year, um, the Meso Foundation funded uh, uh, some work that was being conducted by the International Association on the Study of Lung Cancer. Um, and this involved uh, the staging project. So, um, you know, this, the stage of, the, of a cancer is important to determine because that helps us know how far the cancer spread. It gives us information about prognosis, and it helps us kind of understand from one study to another how the patients are similar or different across studies. And when the staging system was originally developed, it really was uh, based on a very small number of patients and wasn't really very accurate and was hard to interpret. Um, and so um, in conjunction with a very large effort that was going on to uh, restage, uh, to do more, a better st job staging lung cancer, we tagged the, the mesothelioma staging project on. And um, we've collected, and Dr. Roosh has been leading this effort She's at Memorial with me, and uh, has international collaboration to collect information on patients with mesothelioma around the world, several thousand patients. And we've combined all those data into a database to help uh, elucidate a more clear um, uh, staging system. As part of that, and that, that's been funded by the foundation for a while, what what they also wanted to do, though, was to look at uh, tumor volume to see if that also had some prognostic implications. This is important because um, oftentimes on CAT scans, it's very difficult to determine the extent of the disease. It's oftentimes very inaccurate. And so what we are now able to do with more sophisticated uh, computer technology, we can actually uh, use a CAT scan to outline the edges of the tumor and come up with an actual volume of the amount that we feel <coughs> it, it, of a disease that's there. And um, so we're going to use this computer algorithm across the, the uh, several centers that are participating in the staging project to see if that will correspond with outcomes and whether that may be uh, even a better way to look at, um, at staging patients rather than uh, the way we have it currently set up. Okay, um, that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, or if not, um, Dr. Alexander is actually going to talk about the grants that we've funded this year from the review process. <laughs>